Welcome to the last section of the course. At this stage you are already armed with all the tools needed to handle asynchronous flows, however complex. This section will cover quite various things. We will start with a video on making synchronous processes appear asynchronous and why we would do that. We will look back at one of the widgets and spot a pitfall which occurs when not returning any value within a flow. We will also have a comparison of promises versus events since both are ways of coding in asynchronous environments. And we will complete this section with an ES6 specific feature, the promise.race method. Let's start by looking into the concept of making synchronous tasks appear asynchronous and why. In this video, we will talk about two reasons to make more things asynchronous. The first one is when a value is of unknown type, more specifically, if we are unsure whether or not it is a promise. As an example, we will create a search in the iTunes movie library with a very simple caching mechanism. The second reason is actually to purposely make a synchronous call appear asynchronous and to illustrate why we will future proof a to-do list widget. For this video, we have already built two fully functional widgets, which we will enhance. The first one is an iTunes search widget. We simply type a term in the input, click go, and it fetches matching movies from the iTunes API. The template for the widget is really straightforward, so let's directly look at the app.js file and find a controller called iTunes controller. Everything is already coded to work fine. As you can see, it does not call the API itself, but rather uses the iTunes service to perform the search. So it calls iTunes service.search using the search term and returns a promise as is recognizable by the dot then handler. It then slices results and puts them on the scope. Now the idea here is for us to implement caching within the service without having to modify the controller. So let's scroll down and look at the service iTunes service. It contains a search function which, as expected, returns a promise. So everything is working. But let's say we wanted to add a very simple caching mechanism. Let's have an object defined outside of the service var cache results equals to an empty object. And every time we complete the search and we have the response, we will save those results using the search term as the key. Then every time we call search, we will first check whether search term is already cached. So if search term in cache results, then we want to return the results straight away. So return cache results search term. So a nice and simple catch, but one with an obvious problem. The controller actually calls dot then on the return value of the search method. So when our service returns an array of results instead of a promise, this will break. In comes dollar dot when whose job is to wrap any value into a promise. So instead of returning cache results search term, we will return dollar dot when brackets cache results search term. And now we know that we are returning a promise object. Actually, this is slightly less than what $q.when is intended to do because we knew that the array is just a value and not a promise. q.when can actually also be used on a promise object, in which case it will leave it alone. So a nice way to write the search method would be without the if statement, return q.when brackets cache results search term or if unavailable, .http.jsonp, etc. So the q.when is wrapping both the array of cache results and the $http call, which is a promise. Regardless which it is, $q.when ensures that we receive a promise object as a return value. I invite you to have a look at the result in the browser and to search several times for the same keyword without reloading the page, of course, and to see the Ajax calls being made only one time for each keyword. So now we know about the first reason to use $q.when, which wraps a value for which we are unsure whether it's a promise or not and guarantees we get a promise. Let's consider another important reason. The second widget we will use here is a to-do list. Once again, it is fully coded and fully working if you'd like to try it out at this stage. Now let's look at the controller. As you can see, we abstracted the logic into a service called to-do service. That service implements a load, add, and clear methods. You can also see quite clearly that all those methods are synchronous. Scope.todos is set to the return value of load, and there's no sign of dot then handlers. 
Let's scroll down to the corresponding service and indeed you can see that it implements load, add and clear using local storage. All these methods are synchronous since local storage is synchronous. Now imagine that for any reason a decision is made to change the storage and to use something more modern like IndexedDB for example. Well, that's an asynchronous storage, which means that as we implement it, we are going to have to change to asynchronous and thus change the API of this service. And that in turn would mean changing the controller code. Now one of the rules of using services is that they should abstract logic so that it becomes transparent for controllers. So it would be much better if from the start, the service was considered async so that regardless what storage is used, the controllers using that service do not need to be changed. One could argue that if we plan async, what if we move to synchronous later? Well, there's a simple reason for picking asynchronous. Making something synchronous look or appear asynchronous is actually easy. But making something asynchronous appear synchronous is hard and error prone. So given the choice, always go asynchronous for processes that might at any time be changed from async to sync or vice versa, especially since now you are really skilled with asynchronous flows using promises. So how do we modify the code to use local storage but be asynchronous? By the way, I'm reverting the service code to the local storage, but I'm leaving the controller to expect asynchronous behavior. So let's focus on load first. All we need is to load the data from local storage as previously. Var data equals local storage dot get item to do's and wrap the JSON passed value inside a dollar q.when call. You can write this without using a local variable in a one liner, but that's a bit less readable. And that takes care of the load function. Now add will return service.load.then function and the parameter will be the old data. Inside the dot then push the new item to the old data and save it again. There's no need to make that specific part asynchronous. We only care that the public interface of the service is async. And why not return to do so that the controller knows this is the value we just added. So add now returns a promise which will resolve with a value equal to the new task that was added. The clear function is very simple. Just return $q.when brackets and they remove item call. We could actually call remove item and then return q.when with any parameter since the resolution value isn't used anyway. And that's it. With these few changes, we have now future proofed the to do list service so that its interface is asynchronous and thus ready to use things such as indexdb. So in this video, we saw two examples of using $q.when, one to wrap a value into a promise in case we are unsure whether it's already a promise and one case to make asynchronous processes appear synchronous because that is better future proofing than trying to do the other way around. As a note, the ES6 equivalent of $q.when is promise.resolve. In the next video, we will look back at one of the widgets we created earlier and see how there's a missing part in the code which leads to a pitfall. And of course, we'll discuss how to fix that problem.